Germans used to be proud of their cars, but that was before German automakers became embroiled in the diesel emission scandal. These vehicles at the scrapyard in Hamburg aren't that old, and they're still in good condition. But their owners no longer trust diesel technology. How did it come to this? Millions of Germans rely on their cars to get to work, for example. Diesel vehicles have been particularly popular among people like Alexander Zimich from Stuttgart, who have to drive a lot. He works as a security guard in a hospital at the other end of town, and he would be lost without his car, especially when he's on night shift. The vehicle he bought was advertised for years as being particularly economical and green, a promise that persuaded him to part with his money, a purchase that he made in good faith. The clincher for me was being able to drive so far on one tank of fuel, environmentally friendly and with good fuel economy. That was my thinking. Since January, most older diesel cars like his have been banished from the streets of Stuttgart. For locals, the driving ban will come into effect from April onward. You might call Alexander Zimic one of the relatively lucky ones. His employers got him an exemption certificate, but his car is now worth half what it was. I pay my taxes, I pay my bills. So the value of my property should also be secure and not become practically worthless from one day to the next. And not just worthless, but obsolete. It's a catastrophe. Many other diesel vehicle owners could soon face a similar fate. Up to now, driving bans have only gone into effect in Hamburg and Stuttgart. But there have already been court rulings in favor of driving bans in many other cities. Environmental Action Germany has also launched cases against more than 20 other local German authorities. Proceedings there are still ongoing. The legal dispute has also reached Gelsenkirchen. Jürgen Resch, the NGO's managing director, has declared war on German automakers. For months, he's been crisscrossing Germany, celebrating one legal success after another. His goal? a nationwide ban for older makes of diesels. This case involves Gelsenkirchen and Essen. We want clean air for the Ruhr Valley. The sky is blue today, but it shouldn't just look clean. The people here should have the air quality they have been entitled to since 2010 in terms of nitrogen dioxide from diesel emissions. The current legal levels for nitrogen dioxide emissions were introduced in 2010. The court case is purely about upholding those limits. Jürgen Resch is using these regulations as leverage to banish older diesels from urban centers. The Gelsenkirchen court decides in favor of environmental action Germany. The groundbreaking decision? Driving bans for Gelsenkirchen and Essen, including for the first time a stretch of interstate. The A40 in Essen. Up to 120,000 cars travel along here daily. Many of them diesels. It's one of Germany's most important road links for local commuters and long distance traffic. A driving ban on such a vital interstate is a nightmare for transportation policymakers and a triumph for Jürgen Resch. We associate the U.S. with the right to bear firearms. Germans have a similar relationship with the Autobahn. A driving ban for diesel vehicles on one of the main road arteries in the Ruhr Valley area is the clearest warning signal a court can send. It's a clear rebuke to our government and their lack of action. 
So how harmful are diesel emissions? What scientific evidence exists? And how reliable is it? Diesel exhaust fumes contain various substances. Two are deemed especially dangerous. One is the fine particulate matter made up of microscopic solids or liquid droplets. Roadside levels are not legally allowed to exceed an annual mean of 50 micrograms per cubic meter of air. That equates to 50 millionths of a gram. The other is nitrogen dioxide, or NO2, formed from one nitrogen and two oxygen atoms. All combustion processes give rise to nitrogen dioxide. Cars with diesel engines have far greater emissions of NO2 than those that run off gasoline. The legal limit here is an average mean of 40 micrograms per cubic meter of air. The Helmholtz Center in Munich believes fine particulate matter and NO2 are closely intertwined. The organization was involved in setting current permitted levels. Those were based on World Health Organization guidelines. Institute of Epidemiology Director Annette Peters evaluated existing statistics to arrive at her findings about NO2. Due to insufficient data, the WHO drew on additional studies about the impact of nitrogen dioxide levels from gas stoves in indoor environments, even though that had little to do with road traffic. In the end, the WHO arrived at the estimate of 40 micrograms of NO2 as the upper limit. The WHO recommendations established limits which they believed at the time would afford the best possible protection for the population and which, on the basis of research data obtained in 2005, would provide optimum air quality. The Helmholtz Institute findings were primarily based on a large-scale comparison of rates of illness in urban and rural areas. The slightly lower life expectancy rates in cities were attributed to higher exposure to air pollutants, a conclusion that remains controversial. The study we conducted on behalf of Germany's Environment Ministry calculated that this pollution is linked to some 6,000 deaths per year in Germany, or the loss of 50,000 years of life in terms of the population as a whole. These ostensible nitrogen dioxide victims are the Green Lobby's sharpest weapon in the fight against diesel vehicles. A publicity campaign from Environmental Action Germany cites even higher figures from the European Environment Agency. Does nitrogen dioxide really cause thousands of deaths? If that were the case, surely many people would die each year in Stuttgart. The city lies in a valley basin, and the limits for NO2 and fine particulate matter are regularly exceeded. In certain weather conditions, there is even a fine particulate pollution alert. On roads going into the city, signs call on people to park their cars and switch to public transportation. Do people face particularly high health risks during these periods? The Red Cross Hospital in Stuttgart is one of the leading respiratory care units in Germany. Its medical director doesn't think much of the authorities' fine particulate alert. Fine particulate alerts are misleading the public. A state of alert should reflect an acute emergency situation. This is in no way true of current fine particulate matter levels in Stuttgart. The population believes it's dangerous. People with hospital appointments say, we're not traveling into Stuttgart, the air's polluted. We won't set foot in Stuttgart. And they stay at home. Martin Hetzel has first-hand experience. He does not believe that the figures from Munich's Helmholtz Center, which are based purely on statistical comparative studies, reflect the reality on the ground. 
There's no such thing as a fine particulate disease of the lung or the heart, and you don't come across such a thing as a nitrogen dioxide disease of the lung and heart in hospital either. They don't exist. Fine particulate matter, or NO2, hasn't caused a single death. These are abstract mathematical models. It's simply not plausible that such small concentrations of NO2 and fine particulate matter would cause the harm and the deaths that are being publicized at the moment. The figures about premature deaths are being publicized by the German Environment Agency. The organization's medical expert believes that NO2 is harmful even at low levels. But Wolfgang Straf concedes that there's no proof that nitrogen dioxide alone is responsible for thousands of deaths. That's one way of putting it, of course. You could say that there are no deaths and no illnesses due to NO2 because it is impossible to assess the harm done by this one substance in isolation. What we can see in epidemiological studies is its impact. We can see those effects very clearly. When more NO2 is present, these illnesses arise. But what we can't trace is a specific person's diagnosis, a specific illness, back to a single root cause, NO2. Is the German Environment Agency making people nervous with figures about premature deaths linked to NO2 that don't have any firm foundation? The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency doesn't issue such statistics because it believes the scientific evidence is insufficient. We travel to the Sauerland, a predominantly rural area in western Germany. Miners from the Ruhr Valley were sent here to this former Benedictine monastery after World War II to recuperate in the fresh air. The hospital here still specializes in respiratory care. For years, Dieter Köhler, a former president of the German Respiratory Society, was the medical director here. He is also skeptical about the German Environment Agency's data. They compare two groups, rural residents and city dwellers, with respect to NO2. And they pinpoint a small difference in life expectancy. The people in the country live a bit longer. But that might be because they exercise a bit more, drink less alcohol or smoke less, or a range of other different factors. Attributing the difference to nitrogen dioxide or fine particulate matter isn't scientific. They take a statistical correlation and turn it into a causal connection, without proof. On the contrary, it's very easy to refute that connection. You would need to conduct tests with people exposed to high quantities of NO2 and fine particulates over many years to get more precise findings. That's impossible for ethical reasons. But Köhler points out millions of people are taking part in a kind of voluntary experiment of a similar nature. We have the example of smokers. Smokers inhale large quantities of nitrogen monoxide and dioxide. We're talking about doses of 500,000 to a million micrograms per cubic meter. That exceeds the legal limit by many, many factors of 10. Smokers inhale that for many, many years. At some point, because cigarette smoke is dangerous, smokers die prematurely. If you smoke for 40 years, you die about 10 years earlier than a non-smoker, but you don't fall down dead immediately. That's what would happen if these alleged deaths really existed. Instead, smokers withstand these rather large quantities. So something is wrong with a model. This proves it's wrong. What do these air pollution readings in our cities really tell us? The most well-known monitoring station in Germany stands by a busy main road in Stuttgart. High levels of fine particulates and NO2 frequently trigger alerts here. The guidelines for the placement of these monitoring stations stipulate that the levels they measure must correlate to actual exposure levels in the vicinity. Is that true in this case? The station is located on low-lying ground, squeezed into a corner between two large buildings and right next to the road. We want to find out how this location might influence the readings from experts from the Fraunhofer Institute for Transportation and Infrastructure Systems.
They set up their own monitoring equipment right next to the one operated by the southern state of Baden-Württemberg. Professor Matthias Klingner heads the institute. He's very skeptical about the station's roadside position. On this rainy day, the device records seven to eight micrograms of fine particulate matter per cubic meter. Most of that is down to brake and tire wear. Only a small proportion comes from the exhausts of the passing vehicles. What's left is one, at most two micrograms that really come from the diesel engine of the car. It's barely measurable. The next thing that the specialists do is measure the nitrogen dioxide levels. Their own devices quickly reveal that the location right next to the traffic lights has a huge effect on the readings. This reading also shows that the station has a rather problematic location close to the intersection. The reading spikes a lot here. If we look more closely, we can see that it's caused by the cars starting when the lights turn green. That requires more fuel. And that's why such monitoring stations should be quite a bit away from intersections, so that they exclude the readings caused by the cars starting up again. But this way, you record high nitrogen dioxide levels. So what would happen if readings were taken from a location just a few meters away? On the pedestrian bridge over the road, nitrogen dioxide readings are 10% lower. Levels here are less affected by the cars accelerating at the traffic light. At the other side of the bridge is the Stuttgart Palace Garden. Here, 50 meters away from the monitoring station, there are far more people out and about. The levels just a few meters away from the monitoring station are cut in half. From that, it's clear that the monitoring station only tells us about air pollution levels at this spot and not about the rest of the city. In other countries, these stations are not set up this way. Instead, they're built away from the roads. That way, levels aren't exceeded and there are no driving bans. The State Transport Ministry is responsible for maintaining air quality in Stuttgart. According to the ministry, road traffic, including diesel vehicles, is the main source of NO2 emissions. The minister is convinced that driving bans are necessary and rejects criticism of the way emissions are recorded. The monitoring station is at that precise spot because there are homes there. So that's a ridiculous objection. There are very precise guidelines. You have to take readings at hot spots and on key traffic arteries. Monitoring stations can't be located right at the traffic light, but have to be set back a little. We've complied with those guidelines to the letter and have checked this several times. Just because a scientist knows what fine particulates or nitrogen dioxide is, doesn't mean they're knowledgeable about these issues. How badly affected are the residents who live on Neckartor Road? The Fraunhofer technicians are going to take some readings in one of the apartments there. Hello, good morning. Good morning. You're going to Neckartor? Students live here. The rent is affordable because of the apartment's location. Julian Oswald is a sports student. He moved to Stuttgart from the Lake Constance area just a few weeks ago. By Lake Constance, it was very peaceful and the air was clean. Down here in Stuttgart city center, it's a different matter, especially here by a six-lane road. Things get pretty busy at rush hour, and you think twice about airing the apartment, when you should do it and for how long. But is the air worse on the balcony or in the apartment? We set up the equipment in the kitchen. The pump sucks in air from the room through the tubing. The authorities' monitoring station just outside is currently giving a reading of 70 micrograms of NO2, significantly higher than the legal limit. But levels inside the apartment are even higher. The device registers between 41 and 45 parts per billion. That roughly equates to more than 80 micrograms of NO2 per cubic meter. But how can that be? They quickly pinpoint the likely cause. The high levels are probably due to an ordinary gas boiler. 
When something burns, NO2 is almost always formed, as our experiment with normal household candles shows. After about 10 minutes, the levels rise to 76 parts per billion, more than 140 micrograms per cubic meter. That's more than three times the legal limit for nitrogen dioxide in the air outside. If you cook with gas, levels rise exponentially. Making pasta with tomato sauce using two gas rings sends levels shooting up to more than 700 parts per billion in under 15 minutes. Over 1,300 micrograms per cubic meter of air. That's 30 times the legal limit for outdoors. That shocked me a bit. I'll certainly open the balcony door from now on and let some fresh air in when I'm cooking. The German Environment Agency issues no explicit warnings about candles and gas stoves, but it does recommend that you air frequently. The northern German city of Oldenburg produced very unusual air pollution results. The downtown area is a pedestrian zone and readings are taken by a road that bypasses the city center. The state of Lower Saxony chose the location for the monitoring station. The high pollutant levels recorded by this device is causing city leaders a real headache and threatening Oldenburg's entire transportation concept. The readings have also prompted Environmental Action Germany to prosecute the municipal authorities, an action they feel is unjustified. Here there's no chance of recording the true wind conditions and natural ventilation that exist elsewhere in the city. The monitoring station is very close to the wall of a building and extremely close to a fairly busy road. These are the two real problems with it. This isn't a residential area. Few people live here. It's just a thoroughfare for pedestrians and cyclists. I don't see any direct health risk at this spot. Levels were high during the annual marathon, and yet Oldenburg's roads were virtually free of cars on that day. They were cordoned off for road traffic to give runners, helpers, and spectators enough space, so the diesel drivers couldn't have been to blame that day, a fact that got city leaders thinking. Municipal authorities asked Lower Saxony's Environment Ministry to examine the location of the monitoring station again. The outcome, the monitoring station's air pumps were too low. The city also took its own set of readings with passive samplers, small plastic tubes that were mounted across Oldenburg. They showed that levels in Oldenburg are much lower than previously thought. In Oldenburg, we have one station that records levels above the legal limit. We'd be under that limit at almost any other spot. The situation is almost comic, but we have to work with these readings. Yet, by operating on the basis of one reference point in the city that exceeds the limit, we sense we're not exactly promoting public acceptance for what we're doing. At the diesel summit in Berlin last December, local authorities were hoping for help from the top. Faced with the specter of driving bans across Germany and a loss of faith in her government, the chancellor declared the problem a personal priority. Angela Merkel was environment minister when the current legal limit for NO2 was first discussed. Merkel was chancellor by the time it became law in 2010. We asked if it was time to re-examine this controversial limit before driving bans with serious implications were imposed across Germany. Madam Chancellor, the current legal limit for nitrogen dioxide was introduced in your time in office in Germany. Many scientists say it's too low and has no firm scientific basis. Didn't the German government check that closely enough at the time? Yes, we did check it. And these 40 micrograms per cubic meter are based on a recommendation from the World Health Organization. That's not any old organization, and they diverge from other pollutant level limits, for example at the workplace, because of course we have to assume that everyone, from babies to the elderly, spends time outdoors in public spaces. These legal limits weren't just set by Germany, but were agreed with 
other EU members of state and are based on a recommendation of the World Health Organization. What the German Chancellor didn't mention was that the WHO's recommendations are controversial. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, for example, hasn't implemented these limits. In almost all U.S. states, an average annual mean of 103 micrograms per cubic meter is the legal limit for NO2. In the more environmentally conscious state of California, it stands at 57. If Germany adopted such norms, there would be practically no driving bans. The EU was the only place to implement the 40 microgram limit. Meanwhile, Berlin plans to declare driving bans excessive if NO2 levels do not exceed 50 micrograms. But the European Court of Justice is unlikely to accept that. The law also protects bad laws, and we're seeing the effects of that now. The legislative and the executive are currently being chased by phantoms that they conjured up. I see those phantoms in the form of Environmental Action Germany, who were able to cite existing law. Jürgen Resch sees the German government's new goal as a provocation. He would like the laws on air pollution to be tightened up. This limit is actually far too lax. 800,000 people get sick each year because of nitrogen dioxide, according to Germany's Environment Agency. That's populism. It can't be taken seriously. It's populism driven by ideology. Of course, you might have the idea, and that's the ideology behind all of this, of banishing cars from cities. You can do that, but you shouldn't engineer that by setting legal limits without any basis in science. Otherwise, the first diesel emissions scandal will be followed by a second diesel scandal. If the existing legal guidelines aren't based on reliable scientific evidence, then it's a mistake. And mistakes are always rectified at some point. If this is an error, then it is one of the most expensive ones in a long time and one that will hit millions of German diesel drivers hard. Does it really make sense to scrap these diesel cars that still have plenty of mileage in them? We've got them all. VW, Mercedes, Ford, Opel. Business is booming. But Ola Hellbach can't help but find the situation absurd. We have cars that are just nine or ten years old. Common sense tells us that if the car doesn't have serious engine damage, then it should have stayed on the road for a few more years. Has the debate about diesel vehicles lost touch with reality? Isn't it high time for an honest discussion about the advantages and the actual risks of this technology? What amounts to the expropriation of thousands of car owners is no solution for the diesel disaster. <laughs>